Thank you very much. Now, one of the things I noticed, um, or the the 1919 thing, nothing about, particularly about prophecy as such, although it's referring to something that's said in Ezekiel and in Revelation. But all it's to do with is, um, at the end of 1918, beginning of 1919, the, um, the courts in America imprisoned nearly all the senior international Bible students. Yes, eight of them. I were given them terms of about 20 odd years. They were actually in for nine months and then they were given a pardon in, in 1919. It. And you yeah, believe... Right, 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 yes. Right. And you believe the day after they were given that pardon, Jehovah chose the Watchtower Society in 1919. I was wondering if there was any biblical evidence for that. No, no, there's only the, and the fact that they, um, that they actually reorganised themselves and started... Um, but the Watchtower was always printed. That was carried on printed whether in, in, um, in prison or not. But they started um, doing other books again and, and um, holding and holding with conventions and that type of thing in 1919. So that's why we say that um, 1919 has some importance for us. Sorry, could you just say that again? Um, I'm just trying to follow you. Well, there's nothing in Scripture that points to 1919 at all. It's not like um, the 29 CE or um, 1914, where you got, got Daniel's prophecy. But there's nothing that, that suggests that 1919 um, is an important date, particularly. It's only just for us, ourselves. It has a measure of no significance. So is it true or not true that Jehovah chose the Watchtower Society in 1919? We believe it to be true. But you admit that you have no evidence or proof for it at all? Other than that, no. Right. Why should other people believe it? Why should I believe it if, if there's no evidence in the Bible for it? Well, yes, because it's the whole basis of your religion. The Mormons claim that God, Heavenly Father, as they call him, chose them in the 1830s. The Seventh-day Adventists say God chose them as the sole representative on earth in the 1850s. The Christadelphians believe God chose them as the sole representative on earth in the 1860s. Uh, Victor Paul Werwell of the Way International believe God chose them and his group in the 1950s. And there's a host of Pentecostal TV preachers and charismatic TV preachers who claim that God has chosen them as uh, his representative on earth. And you've got earth. the Muslims and the Jews as well, yes. Sorry? And you've got the Muslims who believe the same thing, and the different Muslim um, sects, right. and of course Jews. So lots and lots of I'm groups are saying you that... believe it yourself. So there's lots and lots of different religious groups saying God has chosen us as his sole representative on earth. Well, they can't all be true. Well, I don't belong to any group. Why should I? Why, why should I believe this at all? Why don't I just say it's it's all just made up? It's all just man-made stuff. People giving themselves authority that they don't really have. You know, I don't believe that God has chosen the Jehovah's Witnesses any more than I believe God has chosen the Mormons or the Christadelphians or the Way International to be His sole representative on earth. Is there any other sort of the basic beliefs that we have that you have issues with? Things like soul what happens at death um well in chapter 15 it says jesus rose as a spirit i don't accept that i believe that jesus rose bodily in the same body that he died in that's why post-resurrection the tomb was empty because he rose from the dead in the same body that he died in and that's why when he appeared to his disciples his body he showed them his hands and his feet because it bore the marks of crucifixion the, the, the tomb was empty because he rose in the same body and that body bears the marks of crucifixion because it's the same body that died on the tree. So I have, I have problems with that. That's chapter 15, paragraph 3. 
but it seems that the whole of your religion is based on 1919 the claim that jesus did a cleansing work and he chose the watchtower society he appointed what's called a faithful and discreet slave in the year 1919 well it's either true or it's not isn't it well no very well should we were going before then about 1872 time roughly about there no 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 the but, first no the first the watchtower is then and not even in 1919 no the first watchtower came out in 1879 russell wrote um he wrote a book with somebody else i forget the guy's name barbara i think it was called three oh, worlds yeah, yeah, that, that about, yeah. and i think he guessed guest wrote a few articles and some other publications but the first watchtower didn't start till 1879 well russell claimed uh, well, <laughs> sorry jehovah's witnesses today not 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 russell jehovah's witnesses today claim that their entire authority is based on the date 1919 that's when jesus chose the watchtower society and he appointed a faithful and discreet slave well it's either true or it's not Pardon? I've never seen it put in those words, anything like it. Well, how is it put? Could you... Well, you say that Hope's witness is claiming on her authority is based on 1919. I've never seen that written. You've never seen it written? No. Not that we base her, base her authority on 1919. We base it on scripture, not on 1919. You base it... So you base it on you said you base it on scripture of nineteen nineteen, don't you? No, I don't I don't base it on scripture of nineteen nineteen. That just happens to be a date when certain events happened. That's all. I've got a watchtower in front of me which mentions nineteen nineteen. Let me read it to you. It's the fifteenth of July watchtower two thousand and thirteen page 22 and it's the little white box at the top of the page in the middle column it's uh the heading is appointed over his domestics and it says in 1919 jesus selected capable anointed brothers to be his faithful and discreet slave so it seems to be that your society is teaching in a recent watchtower less than 10 years old that the faithful and discreet slave, which is the basis of your authority, started in the year 1919. Now I see what you're getting at now. Yeah. And by the way, this is not... Let me just go back to that watchtower. And by the way, this is not really very, very honest, because it says, in 1919, Jesus selected capable anointed brothers, that's a plural, to be his faithful and discreet slave. Yeah. Now, yeah. that was not what they were teaching at the time. They teach now that there are faithful um, brothers. Are there, is there, are there eight or nine on the governing body now? Is there eight? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, there's eight on the governing body at the moment. But um, at the time of 1919, they taught that Pastor Russell alone was the faithful and discreet slave i've got a copy yeah, of the, what they thought then. yes i've got yeah. a copy of the finished mystery uh the 1917 first edition of the finished mystery and on page five it says that pastor russell filled the office of the faithful and discreet slave um and there's also a watchtowers and you know i need reading glasses i'm getting old <laughs> same as me <laughs> um I've been given some and they're just not not good enough they don't really help um, I've also got a watchtower from the 1st of April 1920 page 110 which says that Pastor Russell was the faithful and discreet slave I'll yeah. read it to you we yeah. assume that everyone in present truth realizing that his knowledge of present truth uh, came from the Lord through the ministration of his servant will answer the following questions in the affirmative and answering them in the affirmative, we have a basis from which to consider the question as to whether or not the society is the channel used by the Lord as the above suggested. No one in present truth for a moment doubts that Brother Russell filled the office of the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord 
hath made ruler over his house to give them meat in due season. So. But, uh, but, um, but, um, that's Brother Russell. And she died, didn't he? So, that, so that, if that was the, the soul channel, it became non existent. No, 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 it didn't. No, no. Because according to the book, The Finnish Mystery, Pastor Russell was guiding the Watchtower Society from beyond the grave. That's, that's again, the book that I've got, The Finnish Mystery, which is uh, Studies in Scripture, Volume 7, page 144. Yeah, but we um, don't teach that now. We don't teach that now. But, but this is what you were teaching in 1919, that as a, despite dying, Pastor Russell is a sort of form of necromancy. He was guiding the society as a dead person from beyond the grave. I'll just read it. It's The Finnish Mystery, page 144. Um, and another angel, dash, not the voice of the Lord, mentioned in the preceding chapter, but the corporate body, dash, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, which Pastor Russell formed to finish his work. This verse, that's Revelation 8.8, 8, shows that though Pastor Russell has passed beyond the veil, that means he's died, he is still managing every feature of the harvest work. So, so, so was this statement the truth or was it a lie when it was published in the Finnish Mystery? Well, it was a mistake. Well, why should I want anything to do with a religion that makes mistakes? What do you mean no religion does? I don't go to any any church. I don't, I don't have anything to do with any religion. It's one thing for a, a Methodist or an Anglican to make a mistake. Uh, Methodists, Anglicans, Baptists, and your average evangelical Christian, they also make mistakes, as I found to my cost. But they don't claim that they are the sole channel of communication between Jehovah God and man on earth. Now, groups like the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, the Christadelphians, the Way International, some of the extreme Pentecostal groups and the Jehovah's Witnesses and Catholicism, by the way, although who knows what Pope Francis believes. He's so he's so liberal now. Many Catholics yeah. don't even believe Catholic doctrine. But the other groups uh, certainly believe that they are the sole channel of communication between God and men. You, you can't get to God except through the Mormon church, according, according to the Mormons. And you can't yeah. get to God unless you're obeying all the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist according to the Seventh-day Adventist. So if you're going to make claims that you're the sole channel of communication between God and men, which the Watchtower does today, it claims that it is the faithful and discreet slave, the only channel between God and men, then you better get your doctrine right. Now look, when they were teaching in 1919... What's not a doctrine? 1919. Yes, it is. Because in 1919, you claim, you claim that it's doctrine that the faithful and discreet slave was established. And the faithful and discreet slave, at the time you taught, was Pastor Russell, but you admitted that's not the truth, that's a lie. Today, in that 19, sorry, that 2013 Watchtower that I read to you, they're rather dishonest because they claim that anointed brothers were made the faithful and discreet slave in 1919, where there was no governing body in 1919. The governing body came into existence in 1971. So that that watchtower is rather dishonest um, because that 2013 watchtower is rather dishonest because it gives the idea that they were teaching in 1919 what they were teaching in 2013, and they weren't. Yes, but just things. Who said? Who said? Who said that? Emmanuel Volkovsky. 
Veratoski. Right, didn't he write the book Worlds in Collision or something? That's it. That's it. And right, right but Verikoski did not claim to be the sole channel of communication between God I, and men appointed in the year 1919. I'm not saying that. No, but the Watchtower does. The Watchtower says that you cannot get to Jehovah God except through it. You have to be a baptized. You have to be a baptized Jehovah's Witness in good standing, either going door to door or standing beside a cart and doing various theocratic activities, in order to earn a place on the paradise earth or in heaven. You cannot please Jehovah God outside of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now they're entitled to make that opinion. They're entitled to say that. As everybody, well, not everybody else, because the the, the Anglicans, the Baptists, um, and most moderate Protestant Protestants like Lutherans don't make that claim. It's it's only the what's called the cults that make the claim that their little group is the only channel of communication, and you can only get to God or Jehovah or Yahweh or whatever term they use, Heavenly Father for the Mormons, through it. And all I'm saying is Jehovah's Witnesses take the same extreme stance as the Mormons, the Christadelphians, the Way International, the Seventh-day Adventist, that they're it. Unless you are in association with them, baptized, under uh, the control of the elders, and doing theocrat theocratic activity, unless you are in obedience to them, you cannot please Jehovah God. Now, they're entitled to make that opinion, but it's either true or it's a lie. And I've, I've been asking you, can you prove this to me? Can you show me this from the Bible? Well, no, I've told you that. 1919 is not even mentioned. Right, well, then I, I can ignore it, can't I? Because obviously the Watchtower is not the faithful and discreet slave. Anyway, faithful and discreet slave, if you actually read Matthew 24, 45, it's not a statement, it's a question. So it's not the basis for some theological position because Jesus is just asking a question. He's not making a statement. He's not saying, there is a faithful and discreet slave that I will appoint in the year 1919. Jesus isn't saying that. He's asking a question. He's saying, who's going to obey what I have been warning about earlier on in this um, talk, which is now recorded as Matthew 24. And then he gives two examples of two people, a faithful servant and, and uh, in verse 45, and an unfaithful, wicked servant in verse 48. And they ask the question, which of these two servants are you going to be? Are you going to be a faithful servant or an unfaithful servant? And he's, he's applying this to all of his hearers. All the people hearing Jesus, the great multitude, are either going to be a faithful servant because they obey Jesus' words, or they're going to be an unfaithful servant because they don't it obey his words. What is spiritual food? What is spiritual food? Yeah. What is spiritual food? Teaching, encouraging, talk about scriptures. But everyone does that. The Catholics, the Baptists, you go to your local Anglican church. They, the, the pastor gets up and he, he does encouraging. Is, is that spiritual food? It is indeed. It's a form of spiritual food. But um, I wasn't born into the born into the organization or church services. I was what, 27 years old. Right? Where, where, do, where does it say spiritual food in Matthew 24? Could you show it to me please? It doesn't have to, does it? Well it doesn't say spiritual food, does it? I've just read that. Look, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master makes ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Then there's a question mark because it's a question, it's not a statement. It doesn't mention spiritual food at all. You've read that into the text. It's you've read that into the text because you oh, believe. It's physical food. Pardon? It's only talking about physical food. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Of course, it's physical food. You're not going to feed someone no. spiritual food. The master okay. goes away. Okay, but this small points like this. Pardon? I'm never going to see it eye to eye. Well, all I want to do, it doesn't matter if I don't see eye to eye with you. My desire is to obey the Bible, to be obedient to scripture. 
Um, I don't think that in Matthew 24, 45, Jesus is appointing some religious authority that's come into, that's going to come into existence in the 1830s, in the case of the Mormons, in the 1850s, in the case of the Seventh-day Adventists, in the 1860s, in the case of the Christadelphians, in the case of the 1950s, in the fake case of the Way International, or in the year 1919, in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses. He's simply asking a question, and he gives an example of a master who goes away and uh, one servant gives food, obviously not spiritual food, it's physical food to the other servants. The other servant doesn't give food because he says my master delays his coming and so he eats and drinks, not spiritual food. Um, all right, he's just having a good old time knocking back the booze. Uh, and then Jesus is asking a question, which of these two servants are you? Because all of his hearers who heard his talk in Matthew 24 will be one of these two. They're going to either be a wise and faithful servant or they're going to be an unfaithful servant, an evil servant in verse 48. So everyone actually falls into this category. Everyone's either a faithful servant or an unfaithful servant. Sorry, could you say that again? It was hard to hear you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, my voice has gone. It's, um, it's wouldn't it be, as, as your um, voice has gone, wouldn't it have been better to speak to me on Zoom with another elder? I mean, why don't we speak again on a different topic? And maybe you speak to me if your voice, you, you know, you've got a hoarse voice. Speak to me with another elder. Wouldn't that be better? It's very hard for me to hear you and understand you. No, I don't think we only need to have another elder. So I think, Robert, that... Um, but if I, uh, if I can't, thing, I can't really make out why you are inquiring. I want to obey Jehovah God. Church. I want to obey Jehovah God. I want to do the will of Jehovah God. I want to read Jehovah's Bible, his word, and obey it. Can you help me? I can help you. I can help. Well, I can, yes, I suppose I can help you in a way. But it's really looking at some of the basics. So, um, do you believe um, in the immortal soul? Yes, yes, I, I believe that when a person dies, if they are a faithful Christian, their soul goes to be with Christ in, in heaven, yes. But what does, what, uh, what does the Old Testament say about that? The Old Testament is, is rather vague, which is why in Jesus' day you had two schools, the Sadducees, who denied the that you exist after death, and the Pharisees who believe that you do exist as a soul or spirit after death. They both went to the book of Ecclesiastes, to different passages in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you want to determine what happens to people after they die, it's best to go to the New Testament because it gives a clearer understanding of what happens to a person after they die. Um, would you want to talk again on this? I mean, I can give you an example of what I would uh, give as proof that we live on after our death. Math, um, Revelation 20 verse 4. Do you mind if I read it? You can read it, yes. Yeah. Um, now this is probably referring to the tribulation period which hasn't happened yet. It's talking about martyrs who are going to be beheaded for Christ, so they're going to be dead. But despite being dead, they're going to be living and reigning with Christ. So Revelation 20 verse 4, and I saw, an, and I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So here you have people who've been executed. They've been beheaded. And yet it says the souls of those. Now that's a genitive. Genitive is a linguistic possession. Pardon? Well, they're going to be they're going to be ruling over. I imagine the angels in heaven because that's where they're 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 based. Why? But it's. You mean? Because China's doing quite well without it. I I cannot hear you. Could you say that again? So Jehovah was doing very well without it. He doesn't need humans to rule over them. I agree. He doesn't need humans to rule, but he chooses to make those who are his his sons and 
sons of God by adoption, his children of God, he's chosen to make them king priests. They are kings and priests with Christ. Um, and in Revelation 20 verse 4, the word souls, the souls of those, it's what's called a genitive. For instance, if I said the pen of Robert, I'm just picking up my pen, or I'm looking at Robert's phone, right? Robert's phone or the pen of Robert, those are genitive. They are linguistic possessions. They're something that I own. They're not me. They're distinct from me. Now, it, here, the genitive, soul of those, because soul can mean the whole person. If you see an old lady, I live in bungalows where there's lots of old people. I'm the youngest person here. I'm 61. OK, so I'm the youngest person here. But you can see an old lady walking to her bungalow and you could say she is a dear old soul, because that's one way that you can use the word soul to refer to the whole person. Here, that word soul is not being used in that way. It's something separate from the body that's distinct and apart from it because it's a linguistic genitive. The soul of, that's the genitive, those who had been beheaded. So it's talking about dead people. And John sees the souls of those dead people ruling with Christ as kings in heaven. Those who actually go to heaven, yes, but not everybody goes to heaven, do they? Jesus I, said to the John the Baptist, the greatest man that's ever born, but he will not be in heaven, effectively. I, um, Christian scholars see temporary as what's called the intermediate state, a temporary abode for the dead, not the permanent abode. Um, they would refer to passages like Revelation 5.10, they shall reign on the earth. But this perhaps is a big topic. Um, well, can I go to one other verse, Luke, Luke 20, would you mind? No, let me just get it up. And then perhaps if you think about this, maybe we could talk again, but I would suggest we talk on Zoom. And if your voice is hoarse and it's very difficult for me to hear you, why don't you speak to me on Zoom with another elder who's got Zoom? You see, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to have a conversation with you when it is difficult to under, for me to understand you. And surely part of having a dialogue, a conversation, is to understand the other person. Yeah. See, my number was, was published on internet and so forth. It's for people to get hold of, to get hold of somebody who, who is a representative of the congregation just to give things like times and dates and whatnot, just as a contact point. That's why you've got my number. Yes, you're the contact point for Market Harbour, yes? So, yeah. Yes. yes. That's it. Um, so if you said, uh, Luke, Luke 20. Yes, Luke, Luke 20. Um, it starts at verse 27. Um, then yep. some of the Sadducees who deny there is a resurrection came to him and asked him. And then they give him a ridiculous story about a woman whose, whose husband died. And so this then appeals to what's called the law of the lever which was part of the Old Testament law in, I think it's Deuteronomy 25. If, I, if um... This is about the Oliver Rights and the marriage thing. It's, um, it's on the title, I didn't have, um, I didn't have an heir. It, it is very hard for me to hear you, but when the husband died, the, the, the man's brother had to marry the woman. It was like an ancient form of social security, but yeah, you had to yeah. marry the woman to protect her. Well... Um, she married seven brothers and they all died. And so they, they asked Jesus, whose wife is she in the resurrection? Because the Sadducees, although they, they don't believe the same thing as Jehovah's Witnesses, it is slightly different. The Sadducees believe that when you were dead, you ceased to exist, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Although you yeah. do claim that there will be a recreation from Jehovah's memory, not quite the same thing as a resurrection but you believe that Jehovah from his memory will recreate people. Well, resurrection, does it, does it mean um, standing up again? Yes, yeah, standing up again in the same body that you died in. That's how everyone in church history has understood the word resurrection. And if you go to verse 37 and 38, I think we find that people do live on after their death. All right? Um, no, I'll try that, Tom. Well, I haven't I read it yet. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't read it yet. You can't disagree with me. I haven't even read it yet. Let me read verse 37 and 38, and then you can disagree all you want. At least you've got a sense of humour, brother. 
<laughs> well, I think I need to doing this. Um, now, even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he yeah. said, when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. Yeah, now, that's right. Now, the Greek, the Greek language is far more accurate than Hebrew and Aramaic. I'm obviously not a biblical scholar. I wish I was. I did try biblical Greek and Hebrew, but I'm afraid I was an unmitigated failure. That's the honest truth. I wasn't clever enough to do Greek and Hebrew, so I tried. Um, there are no... There are no tenses for verbs like past tense and present tense and future tense in Hebrew. I'm not sure about Aramaic. Um, that's supposed to be fairly similar languages when, when they were written. Yeah. Or is that fairly modern? Yeah. But the point I'm making is there's no past tense or present tense or future tense in Hebrew. There's only two states, the complete state and the incomplete state. All right. All right. And sometime... Um, things are written in the Bible as if they've already happened when they haven't happened. I, I remember many years ago speaking to some Jewish students at Speaker's Corner. This would be well over 30 years ago in the late 1980s in London. And they absolutely whooped me. They gave me a theological whooping because I said that Isaiah 53 applied to Jesus and they said, well, if you read it, it's all in the past tense. Who has past tense believed our report and to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed? Uh, and then it, and then they pointed out the past tenses in this passage. Now, I didn't have the knowledge at the time to understand that this is written in what's called the prophetic perfect. In the Hebrew, it's in the complete state. It's not complete because it's happened. It's complete because it's biblical prophecy and whatever God says will happen. It's written as if it's already happened. Yeah. So, yeah. so I didn't understand that at the time. Um, I've got sort of distracted a little bit, but the point I'm trying to make is that in Luke, Luke 20, 30, 37 and 38, Jesus says that he, he is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are not dead, they're living. And then we read in verse 38, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, meaning Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, for all live to him. So Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who had died centuries before the burning bush passage, when Moses saw God at the burning bush, according to Jesus, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were living at the time that Moses yeah, saw the burning bush. Just but, read what but, verse 38 says again, please. I'll read verse 37 and 38. Okay. For even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised, when he's called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Yeah, in our translation, because it probably slightly modified it, so many people do not understand old, older English terminology. For they are all living to him. Would that sound the same to you? That's exactly the same as my version. And this is not old English. This is the new King James version, not the all original right. King James. It reads exactly the same. Yeah, so for all, all live to him. Because they're going to be resurrected. That's the reason why. Yes, but they are actually living at the time that Moses appeared at the burning bush passage. That's the well, point no, that, that Jesus is sense. making. That doesn't make sense. That's not logical. Well, their bodies are in the grave, but their souls or their spirit are with Christ. See, that's why that's they're right. living. They're living as souls or spirits, just as in Revelation 20, verse 4, we read of people living as souls or spirits. Yeah. We're going to have a difference on this about the use of Defesh and Psyche and Ruach and what's it, Numa, uh, Numa. Well, what I suggest is why don't we, why don't we speak again some other time on Zoom and because it is a bit hard to hear you because of your hoarse voice, maybe we yeah. could speak with another elder if that's possible. What I'm going 
have you got the um, jw.org up at all no i don't I, I go from the Bible. I don't go from Mormon apps where I spend the rest of my life reading Mormon literature or Mormon apps. I don't go from Seventh day Adventist literature on Seventh day Adventist apps. Okay, I, 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 I don't have the time to spend the rest of my life reading Mormon literature, Christadelphian literature, Seventh day Adventist literature, extreme Pentecostal literature by Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Morris Sorello, Rodney Howard Brown. I don't have the time. So I prefer to focus on the Bible and see what the Bible says. Because if you listen to these people, what they do is they get you reading their literature on their apps. And I don't have the time. My, uh, the Bereans were called more noble because they studied the Bible. I know they didn't have apps at the time in Berea and in Acts 17. But if they did have apps, I don't think they would have been praised as being more noble because they spent all their time see if the, seeing if these things were true by going to jw.org or lds.org, which is the Mormon equivalent with thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of Mormon literature. And then there's the Seventh-day Adventist equivalent where the Seventh-day Adventists have their website with tens of thousands of pages of literature. The Bereans were praised because they went to the Bible, they tested things from the Bible. And, and, yeah. and also, look at Jesus' transfiguration. Jesus appeared before his um, Peter, James and John, and in Mark 9, he was transfigured before them in Mark 9 too. Yeah. And it says that Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. So Elijah and Moses were living. Now, they weren't living in their physical bodies. Their physical bodies were rotting in the grave. So it would have been the spirits of Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus in the transfiguration. Let me read it. Um, Mark 9, 2. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became exceeding shining, became shining, exceeding white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. So obviously the, Elijah and Moses hadn't been resurrected. Their bodies are still rotting in the grave. This is obviously the spirits of Moses and Elijah who are living on after their death. And here they appear with Jesus and talk to him. It says, it says, it says, and Elijah appeared to them with Moses. Uh, Mark 9, 4, and Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. It says Elijah appeared to them. You see, the problem I have is that only one of us is giving the scriptures. That's, that's me. This is the, this is the problem. You can say I'm wrong. Scriptures can be interpreted what people do interpret differently. Right. Because why you have different religions but um why don't we prepare on a topic and we speak on zoom on one agreed topic we don't jump to a different topic every 10 minutes we stick on one topic that, yeah that would make sense i think okay let's have a look let's have a look at the soul then the soul okay Soul or spirit? I believe there is interchange between the two terms to some extent. Um, that, that's where we differ. Well, let's let's discuss that. Let's let's look at the soul then, okay? Yeah, just... And we'll meet on Zoom. No, don't talk now. I think it's best to prepare. No, I'm just looking to see. Um, yeah. as, to what, um, as to what my schedule is. Yeah. Okay. No, you, you can't do Mondays, can you? I can't do Mondays. Any time is fine. Just text me a time, giving me at least a day's notice. I don't care. And I think we should speak on Zoom and you should find another elder because it is very difficult to understand you at, at, at times because of your voice being rather hoarse. Well, I can't guarantee getting another elder on certain times. Why don't I leave it with you and you get you get back to me? Just just text me the time, giving me a day's notice. I don't care 
when it is, as long as it's not on a Monday. No. Okay, then. Right, I'll see what I can do. Okay, that's lovely. All the best. Bye.